Good morning. I'm so glad that really can't happen. <laughs> Welcome to WWDC. It's great to be back in San Jose, the heart of Silicon Valley and right down the street from Apple in our new campus. It's been 15 years since we held the developer conference in San Jose, and an awful lot has changed. But the one thing that hasn't changed is our commitment to the developer community and our ability to do amazing things together. This is going to be the best and biggest WWDC ever. <laughs> Every year, we host WWDC to bring Apple engineers and our amazing developers together on our collective mission to change the world. And I'm pleased to tell you the Apple developer community has never been more vibrant. We now have 16 million registered developers in the program around the world, and we added 3 million last year alone. We've got 5,300 developers here this morning, our largest group ever. We have attendees this morning from 75 countries across the world. It's truly a worldwide conference. And we have the most student developers with us this morning ever. In fact, one of our youngest is here this morning. His, his name is Yuma Sorianto. He's from Australia, and he's just 10 years old. He started coding when he was six, and he already has five apps on the App Store. I met Yuma yesterday, and I can't wait to see what he's going to accomplish next. And while we've got some great up-and-coming developers like Yuma, we've got some that got a bit of a later start. Masako. Masako Wakamiya is just 82 years old, and she's from Japan, and she published her first app earlier this year. So, so if you haven't published yet, there is still time. Let's give them a big round of applause. Now let's turn our attention to our four incredible platforms. Of course, as you know, each of them stem from the same core technology, but each is uniquely expressed and designed for the best experience for where they work. We keep pushing these platforms forward, giving you, the developers, powerful tools and opportunities to change the world. That's why this developer conference is so important. Now, we have a lot to talk about today, and I do mean a lot. So I'm dispensing with the updates other than to tell you Apple's doing great. Yeah. We have six important announcements to share with you this morning. So let's get right into it, and I'll start with tvOS. We recently introduced the TV app on Apple TV, iPhone, and iPad to create the easiest way to discover and enjoy your TV content from across your video channels all in one convenient place. We launched it with support from just a handful of video channels, but now we have 50 partners integrated into the TV app. And today, we're really thrilled to announce that Amazon is coming, <laughs> Amazon is coming to the TV app and, Apple, and all Apple TVs later this year with Amazon Prime Video. And of course, as you know, Prime Video provides a wealth of great content, thousands of TV shows and movies, and some great original content like Transparent, 
Mozart in the Jungle, Man in the High Castle, and so much more. We are so pleased to welcome Amazon to Apple TV. So that's TVOS. You'll be hearing a lot more about TVOS later this year. Number two, let's talk about Apple Watch. <laughs> Apple Watch has had incredible growth this past year. In fact, it's the number one selling smartwatch by far. And what's most important to us is that it's number one in customer satisfaction again by far. Apple Watch is designed to help you live a healthier life, and people are absolutely loving the fitness capabilities, the health capabilities, the quick access to information, and even the ability to swim with it. We've got some exciting updates to the Watch OS, and to take you through them, I'd like to invite Kevin Lynch up. Kevin? <laughs> Thank you, Tim. So watchOS is moving forward really quickly, and I'm very excited to introduce watchOS 4 today. This furthers the areas that people love and also introduces new ways to make the watch more personal to you. Let's start with watch faces. Now, Apple Watch is great for quickly glancing at information, and many people are using a watch face like this today. And now you need to choose what information shows up here. So for example, weather, calendar, and workouts, or maybe you'd like to look at the date and reminders and sunset. The information that you'd like to see actually varies based on time and your location and your routines. What if we could actually show you a selection of information that you might need automatically? Well, Siri is becoming more and more a proactive assistant, knowing what information you need, when you need it. And we've created a new watch face which is powered by Siri intelligence. This is the new Siri watch face. Now, it automatically displays the information that's most relevant to you, and you can also access Siri just by tapping on the new complication on the top left. And it automatically displays this information with the same type of intelligence we've applied on iOS. We're using machine learning to adapt automatically based on your routines and the apps that you use when you use them. So in the morning, I might see, for example, commute time and my first meeting. And if I rotate the crown, I can see more information from Siri. For example, reminders or even photo memories from this same time last year or maybe from this location. And throughout the day, whenever you raise your wrist, the face will dynamically update with information for you. So for example, at noon, I might see a reminder to make a call, and I might get a pass to a flight that I'm taking that afternoon. So relevant passes in wallet can appear here right in the face, including from third-party apps. Now at the end of the day, I might see what time the sun's going to set, and also I can get access to controls I tend to use in the home app at night. So this is an intelligent, proactive assistant right on your wrist, and this is the new Siri face on Apple Watch. Now, sometimes you might like kind of less information and more graphics, and that's the soul of the new kaleidoscope face. It displays a beautiful, symmetrical pattern that slowly changes throughout the day. And you can rotate the crown, and you can get this kind of trippy effect whenever you want. And there's multiple styles you can choose from. So for example, if you use a photo like this, you can create a variety of kaleidoscope styles. This is the new kaleidoscope face. Now, Mickey and Minnie have been a big hit on Apple Watch, and more characters have been working to find their way in. And I'm really excited to welcome Woody and Jesse and Buzz. They're going to be right at home inside the watch, and they're so much fun. And whenever you raise your watch with the Toy Story face, you're going to see a variety of vignettes, kind of like this. <laughs> There's a lot of hijinks going on in there. Um, so these are three really lively new faces in watchOS, Siri face, Kaleidoscope, and Toy Story. Now let's talk about activity. Apple Watch has already been helping many people improve their health and fitness, and activity is one of the most frequently used apps on the watch. In watchOS 4, activity notifications are more personalized to you to help you close your rings more often. So you might start off each day with some inspiration by receiving an update like this. This lets you know if you're close to accomplishing an achievement or what you can do to match yesterday's goals. And these are all personalized to you. And as part of this smarter coaching, we're also introducing monthly challenges. And these challenges are designed to help you 
either beat or repeat something that you accomplished or came close to doing, and they're all achievable because they're based on your real history. And like every great coach, we want to celebrate your success. So we've added a little bit more fun when you close your rings or earn an achievement. So you'll get smaller celebrations for everyday successes and bigger celebrations for harder to reach milestones. Now we've also enhanced the workout app to be even easier to use and more powerful. Starting with the new UI, where quick starts right up front, you can just tap and go, it's much easier. And customers have really loved the new swimming capabilities in series two. And we're now enhancing the pool swim workout with auto sets. So just by taking a rest at the edge of the pool, we'll automatically mark each set of swimming that you're doing. And at the end, you'll even get your distance for each stroke type and your pace for each set that you're doing. And we also are creating, it's great, the pool swim thing is very popular. We've also created some custom motion and heart rate algorithms for a new workout type called high intensity interval training. Now this is one of the most popular workouts in the world, so we know it's gonna be a favorite for a lot of you when you start using it. Now if you like to do more than one workout in a row, it's now super easy to just swipe over during a current workout and then add another one by pressing the plus button. So you just press plus, and I can continue with another workout. For example, I might do some outdoor cycling here. I just tap, and I continue. Super easy now to do multiple workouts in a single session. Now many people are doing the workouts indoors at a gym. And when you use gym equipment, it has data the Apple Watch doesn't have, and the watch has data the gym equipment doesn't have. So you end up with numbers like calories and distance that don't quite match. So in watchOS 4, we've come up with a great solution to this. We're enabling, for the first time, two-way data exchange in real time with gym equipment. So you'll be able to simply tap your Apple Watch on an NFC reader on the gym equipment. Your watch will automatically launch the workout app and you can connect. And then your heart rate is read by the watch and sent to the equipment. And data like incline and speed is sent from the equipment to your watch. And when you start and stop the workout in your gym machine, it does the same thing on your watch. So now all the information matches, it's much easier, and it's a lot more accurate. Now this is being supported by the largest gym manufacturers in the world, who provide about 80% of equipment in gyms today. And Apple Watch enabled equipment will be rolling out starting this fall. Now let's talk about music. Apple Watch paired with AirPods has really become a magical combination. And we're redesigning the music app on Watch to make this a really great experience. With the new music app, we're going to automatically sync music for you based on what you love to listen to. So for example, we'll automatically get your Apple Music mixes, like new music and favorites, freshly updated on your watch. And the app simply presents some beautiful album art and playlist images, and you can just navigate by rotating the digital crown. When you get to the album you like, you can just tap and play. So you can easily play your music now, and we support multiple playlists and music on the watch now, so your music that you love is gonna be ready when you are and making Apple Watch and AirPods a truly magical listening experience. That's the new music app. Now let's take a look at this. To give you a quick demo of watchOS 4, please welcome Vera Carr from the Watch and Health Engineering team. Thank you, Kevin. Good morning. I'm so excited to be here. The first thing I want to show you is the new dock. I can now vertically scroll through my recently used apps, like the new music app. Using the dock makes finding the apps I'm looking for easier than ever. Next, let's look at the new intelligent Siri watch face. Here in the warm morning, I could see things like the weather for today and my upcoming events. Later today, I'm heading back to San Francisco to see my parents. And in the afternoon, the Siri face will proactively update to tell me how long it'll take me to get there. Tonight, we're going to see the new Alien movie, which I'm super excited about. No one spoil it for me. For any content in the Siri face, I could tap directly into the app for more details. Here, for example, the Siri face has my tickets, so tonight I can just raise my wrist, and with one tap, they'll be ready. The Siri face also shows me timely content like photo memories and news. Here's a news headline picked for me by the brand new news app now available on Apple Watch. In the app, I can view stunning photos, glance at top news stories throughout the day, and save them for later to be read on my phone. We've also integrated our new activity coaching notifications directly into the Siri face. Now, when it's near the end of your day, or you're close to closing your rings, 
Our coaching algorithms will tell you how much you need to walk to hit your move goal. I did a lot of nervous pacing before this, so now I just need to take a 16 minute walk. Let's close those rings. We've added something new here in workout that's really cool. Music instantly gets me motivated, and now in watchOS 4, I can pick a playlist that automatically starts with my workout. Let's do it. And when I'm in a workout, I can quickly swipe to the left and control my music right here. <laughs> These are only a few of the new features in watchOS 4. I can't wait for you to try it out. Back to Kevin to tell you more. Yeah. Terrific job, Vera. Thank you. There's a lot more coming in watchOS 4, including, for example, a new flashlight in the control center, which you can also use as a blinking safety light when you're doing an evening run. There's a lot, lot more happening here. Now, we, of course, have a number of updates that enable great apps by developers in watchOS, including more support for apps running in the background, faster app responsiveness, and some new UI capabilities. And we're also now supporting native core Bluetooth on the watch, which is going to enable experiences for apps that work with small devices around you. So for example, continuous glucose monitoring directly from Dexcom sensor to your watch, or Zap Tennis, which connects to a sensor on your racket for real-time swing analysis when you're playing, or Zensor, which connects your watch to your surfboard so you can actually see the height of the waves you're doing and how many calories you're burning while you're still in the water. So lots of new possibilities here for watchOS. <laughs> Developer preview is available today, so you can get going. And there's a free upgrade for everyone across all watches this fall. And that's just some of what's coming in watchOS 4. Please welcome Tim back to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Tim. WatchOS 4 is a great update. Now, let's talk about a product that in many ways is the heart and soul of Apple. And of course, I'm talking about the Mac. There's never been a computer quite like the Mac. The Mac is so important in fueling the world's passion and creativity. It's a computer all of us love to use, and no one can match the Mac's deep integration of hardware and software. And of course, at the heart of the Mac experience is Mac OS. And to tell you about what's next with Mac OS, please welcome Craig Federighi. Craig? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Hey, good morning. Well, let's talk about Mac OS. Now, our current release of Mac OS, of course, is Mac OS Sierra. Now, Sierra brought Siri and Apple Pay to the Mac, let you put your documents and your desktop in the cloud, and even let you unlock your Mac automatically using the watch on your wrist. Now, people are loving Sierra, and we love it too. So we wanted to spend this year perfecting it. But of course, the question is, what do we call it? So we enlisted, once again, our crack marketing team. They were giddy to hop in their minibus and this time venture east, deep into the Sierras, but this time ascending its highest peaks. And when they finally came back, they had a name they said felt really, really good. And it's my privilege to announce for you today, Mac OS High Sierra. <laughs> Now, we talked to the guys and we said there might be, this might be misconstrued, but they assured us this name is fully baked. So, now, High Sierra is all about deep technologies that provide a powerful platform for future innovations on the Mac. But we couldn't help ourselves, we also added some refinements. And it starts with Safari. Now, Safari is known for its efficiency and its legendary battery life. But Safari is also incredibly fast. In fact, 
we benchmark Safari on the same hardware running Mac OS and Windows with all the popular browsers, and Safari smokes them in benchmark after benchmark. Jetstream, speedometer, motion mark, Safari tops them all. So that's right, Safari is the world's fastest desktop browser with High Sierra. And Safari's domination continues with the new modern version of JavaScript, ECMAScript 5, where you can see Safari delivers 80% faster performance than Chrome. Now, in addition to being tremendously fast, Safari also helps give you a serene browsing experience. Now, you know sometimes you go to read an article, and instead of finding something to read, you get this? Just some loud audio and video that auto plays and disrupts your whole reading vibe? Well, now, don't worry about it, because we have autoplay blocking in Safari. <laughs> Safari detects the sites that shouldn't be playing video and puts you in control. You can always push play. Now, Safari is also key in respecting your privacy. Now, have you ever had this experience where you go to buy something on the web, you know, even complete the purchase, and then it seems like everywhere you go on the web, it just follows you around. It kind of feels like you're being tracked. And that's because you are. <laughs> no longer, because Safari has intelligent tracking prevention. <laughs> Safari uses machine learning to identify trackers, segregate the cross-site scripting data, put it away, so now your privacy, your browsing history is your own. It's not about blocking ads. The web behaves as it always did but your privacy is protected. Next, I want to talk about some refinements to mail, and it starts with search. So in addition to providing searches based on recency, search in mail is now using Spotlight to identify your top hit. So the message you're looking for is almost always right there at the top. And if you're into using mail in full screen, well, now we support split view for your compose window. It's a great way to compose mail. And mail is more efficient than ever. It actually uses 35% less disk space for storing your mail. Now, probably our biggest area of refinement in High Sierra is in photos. Now, yeah. Photos has some great new organization and editing tools. There's a persistent sidebar and a new view that has all your imports in chronological order. And in any view up here in the upper right, you can filter by your keywords, by uh, your favorites, by just media types like video. So it's really easy to get to just what you're looking for. We've also improved faces. It recognizes far more faces automatically using advanced convolutional neural networks. And when you put effort into categorizing and naming people, well, that's now synchronized automatically across all your devices. <laughs> now, we also have some great enhancements to editing inside of photos. So you can see here on the right-hand side, all of your editing tools are arrayed, and there are a bunch of great new ones, including curves, which allows you to fine-tune the color and contrast in your image, and selective color, which lets you modify color in a selective range. And I think you're going to like this one, because if you like to do edits in a pro tool like Pixelmator or Photoshop, well, now when you punch out to that other editing tool, all of your edits automatically synchronize right back to your photo library. Now, Apple pioneered printed books on pr based on projects you construct right inside of the photo application. And now we're opening this up to third parties. They're going to offer some amazing new printing services, full framed uh, wall-mounted uh, photos, and even publishing websites all based on projects right inside of photos. So those are some quick refinements, but I want to return to the main story now. And that's technology, because we've gone deep on the fundamentals, data, video, and graphics. And when it comes to data, the fundamentals are in the file system. Now, the Mac file system has its roots, actually, HFS, from 30 years ago. Well, a lot has changed since then. We have a lot of flash drives. Our storage is a billion times larger. And it's time for a more modern file system so I'm pleased to announce that we're bringing the Apple file system to Mac OS as our new default. Yeah. 
Now, APFS is a thoroughly modern file system, 64-bit, top to bottom. It's safe and secure with built-in crash protection and native encryption, and it's ultra-responsive with modern features like instant file and directory cloning and high-performance parallelized metadata operations. Now, what does that really mean in practice? Well, let's take a look at a simple file duplication inside of Sierra. So we're gonna go up to the file menu, select duplicate on these very large video files, and it's gonna copy. And just like you'd expect, there's a lot of data to be copied here, so it takes a little while. Just about done. There we go. Now let's watch that in High Sierra. Well, we're gonna go up to the file menu, we're gonna sub-duplicate, and we're done. Next up, video. Now, the current standard in video is H.264. In fact, H.264 has really enabled the revolution of streaming HD video on the internet. But of course, the game has moved from HD to 4K and 4K high dynamic range video. And there's a new standard to support this. It's H.265 or HEVC. And you want your video to look great, preserve all the detail and color, and HEVC does it while saving up to 40% better compression than H.264. Now we're building in software encoder support into High Sierra for all Macs and hardware acceleration of HEVC for the newest Macs. And we're also building it into Pro Tools like Final Cut, Motion, and Compressor. Now I want to return to our main story, which is graphics. And graphics are all about the GPU. The GPU has been the performance superstar of the last decade, delivering incredible gains in computational performance. Now, our API for high-performance graphics is Metal, and developers have taken amazing advantage to Metal. This is Dawn of War 3 from Feral Interactive, incredible graphics. This is DaVinci Resolve from Black Magic, which can accel accelerate many editing operations. And of course, we even use Metal inside of Photos for doing machine learning and identifying your photos. But we've learned a lot working with developers on their adoption of Metal, and we have a new version to announce today. And you'll never guess what we called it. It's Metal 2. <laughs> now, Metal 2 is tremendously fast. In fact, it has great optimizations and new APIs that, when adopted, deliver another 10 times improvement in draw call throughput. Now, some of you remember when Metal first came out, it itself had a 10 times improvement over OpenGL. You can multiply those numbers together. That's 100 times improvement. Now, we've also provided better, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, debugging and performance analysis tools for you to optimize your app for Metal. And we're so excited about the advances in Metal 2 that we've taken the Mac Windows server and put it on top of Metal, accelerating things like mission control. And some of our most challenging system animations are now buttery smooth all the time. Now, Metal is not just about graphics. We're also using it for machine learning. It can now accelerate, yes, we have Metal performance shaders that accelerate all kinds of deep learning algorithms. Now, another piece of Metal news today is metal for external graphics. So you know our MacBooks have this tremendous balance of portability and power. But sometimes, for some workflows, you need even more power. You want to take advantage of the incredible Thunderbolt I.O. on your MacBook Pros to access external graphics. So we're going to be making this possible in Metal 2. Now, we're starting with the developer, developer kit that will be available today. You can actually order a Thunderbolt 3 enclosure with a high-performance AMD GPU and tune your apps for high-performance external graphics. And then we'll be rolling out support to all of our customers in the months to come. Now, with this graphics power, we're really doubling down on our focus on pro content creation. And that's increasingly about VR content creation and so we're bringing metal for VR to High Sierra. Now, metal is delivering a VR optimized display pipeline that provides extremely high performance. And we're optimizing our pro apps like Final Cut for doing things like editing spherical video right inside the VR environment. We're also working with Valve. They're bringing the Steam VR SDK to the Mac. And we've worked with Unity and Unreal to bring their engines for VR to the Mac.
It's really cool, and you might just be seeing a little bit more from us later today on this topic. So that's a quick look at Mac OS. Some great technologies with the Apple file system, HEVC video, and incredible graphics with Metal 2, support for external graphics, and VR support on the Mac. And of course, a bunch of fantastic refinements. Now, Mac OS High Sierra is available for all of you today as a developer beta, and if you sign up, at beta.apple.com. We'll also have a public beta available later this month. And of course, it's shipping to everyone as a free upgrade this fall on all systems that support Sierra. Now, that's your update on macOS High Sierra, and I'm gonna turn it over to our Vice President of Hardware Engineering, John Turnus, to tell you more about the Mac. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. So we have some great updates to talk about today that span much of the Mac product line. And let's begin with the iMac. Now, the iMac has been the gold standard of desktops for many years, but we're gonna raise the bar once again. And as always on the iMac, it starts with the display. Because the 4K and 5K Retina iMac displays with their high resolution, excellent brightness, and P3 color gamut are the best displays on any desktop but we're gonna make them even better. So these new displays are now gonna be 500 nits. That's 43% brighter than the previous generation. And for the first time, we're gonna support 10-bit dithering, which means these displays can reproduce up to a billion colors. So your content is gonna look more true to life than ever before. Now, in addition, we've got some great internal updates for these iMacs. So we'll start with the CPU, because the whole line is moving to Intel's seventh generation core processor also known as Kaby Lake. Now, Kaby Lake gets us better bass and turbo frequencies for more performance, as well as hardware-based 10-bit HEVC decode, which is great for playing back high-quality video. In addition, these iMacs are getting a boost when it comes to memory capacity. So the 21.5-inch systems can now be configured with up to 32 gigs of memory, and the 27-inch can go all the way up to 64 gigabytes of memory. Both of those are twice what the previous generation could do. Now, fast storage has always been a key part of the iMac, and so we're gonna now make our Fusion Drive standard on all 27-inch configs. And it's also gonna be standard on the high-end 21.5-inch config as well. In addition, our SSD options are gonna be up to 50% faster and now available up to two terabytes. And the iMacs are getting an I.O. upgrade as well, because we're giving them two USB-C connectors which support Thunderbolt 3. And we think our customers, especially our pro users, are really gonna love this, because you can do some cool things, like hook up a high-performance RAID array and an external 5K display at the same time. So now let's talk about graphics. And as you heard earlier, we're investing heavily in graphics software technologies like Metal 2. Well, we're also investing in graphics hardware. And every configuration in this new iMac line is gonna get a big bump in its graphics performance. So we'll start with the entry-level iMac. Now this system gets a boost in its integrated GPU by way of Intel's Iris Plus graphics, which now has 64 megabytes of VDRAM. And the performance that we're getting out of this is pretty amazing, because this system is up to 80% faster in graphics than the previous generation. Now next up is the 21.5-inch iMac with Retina 4K display. And the big news here is that we're going to be moving to discrete graphics and making it standard on all 4K iMacs. And that's going to come, there you go, and that's going to come in this Radeon Pro series GPUs with up to four gigabytes of VRAM. And again, this move to discrete graphics yields a pretty spectacular performance increase because this new system is up to three times faster than the previous generation for graphics. Now lastly, we have our 27-inch iMac, and this is our most popular desktop for our pro customers. So obviously, it's gonna get a bump in graphics today as well. So it's gonna have these Radeon Pro 500 series GPUs with up to eight gigabytes of VRAM. And again, we get a great performance uplift. In fact, this 27-inch iMac can now deliver up to five and a half teraflops of graphics compute which makes it a great platform for VR content creation. In fact, we've seeded some developers with this new iMac and High Sierra so that we can see what they can do with virtual reality on the Mac. And I'm really excited that we can give you a demo of some of this amazing work right now. 
So I'd like to invite up on the stage, here from Industrial Light and Magic, his Academy Award winning visual effects artist and chief creative officer, John Knoll. John? Thank you, John. At Lucasfilm's ILMX lab, story, concept design, and technical development are all intertwined. They come together for us to create immersive experiences for people to enjoy at home, in cinemas, and at theme parks. Now, I've always done my art and development on a Mac, so I'm really excited about these new iMacs. I truly love the platform, so I'm especially, uh, especially excited to be able to share some of our VR content created on these new iMacs in Epic's Unreal Engine. I'm joined by Lauren Ridge, an Epic programmer, who will be backstage driving our demo. Uh, we, working together, we can work in real time <laughs> uh, to create an immersive experience as we step inside the Star Wars universe. Now, Lauren's backstage so we can show you the environment around her. And now, we're going to show you from my perspective. Here we are on the planet Mustafar. Thanks to the native VR support in macOS High Sierra, I can use Unreal Engine's editor to create content inside the VR experience. And for the first time, it's all powered by my Mac. On my left motion controller, I have my radial menu, which acts as my artist palette. And on the right, I have the laser I use to interact with the world. I have some fire here, so let's try that out. <laughs> All right, very nice. Uh, let's do some set dressing. What do you have? Let's see. Let me open my content browser. It has all the assets I need to dress my scene. I think I saw a good landing spot for an Imperial shuttle over here, so let's bring one of those in. We've actually set up these smart assets so they know exactly where to come in for their landing. Great. All right. Uh, can we go wide? Sure, I can grab onto a little two hands and scale myself up. I can also use this to rotate the world around me. Oh, very cool. I have a TIE fighter here too, so let's bring one of those in. Thanks to the more than five and a half teraflops of GPU performance, manipulating objects is super smooth and really intuitive. <laughs> Great, all right, can we have a squadron of those flying overhead? Okay, what about from over there on the horizon to over there by the castle? Great, perfect, okay. All right, let me teleport back down. Oh, hey, seeing the castle back there reminds me we're missing one important element. Right, how could I forget? All right, nice. Well, it looks really good silhouetted against the sky back there. Can we go in closer? Sure thing. It's really cool how Metal 2 unlocks Unreal's advanced rendering feature set on the map. Wow, yeah, really nice. All right, uh, let's play this scene from here. Okay. Oh, he's upset. That's the third one this week. He didn't see me there. Mm. Wouldn't be so sure about that. All right, actually, let's stop it right there. That was a close one. <laughs> uh. Well, it's, it's really nice to see an iMac rendering this level of graphics in VR mode at a smooth 90 frames a second. Really great. All right, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Metal 2 and Unreal's, uh, our Epic's Unreal Engine will enable the next generation of storytellers. We use this technology in our filmmaking every day for virtual set scouting, for art direction, and shot design. And that means that this immersive content can be made by the same people that bring you the films. That's incredibly powerful. At Lucasfilm and ILMX Lab, we're looking forward to using our Macs to create new experiences as we invite people everywhere to step inside our stories. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, John and Lauren. That was awesome. So that is our update to the iMac line. And to recap, 
They have the best Mac displays we've ever made. Faster processors, higher memory capacity, super fast storage, Thunderbolt 3, and as you saw, incredible graphics performance. <laughs> so here's the line, and, but there's one more change because we're gonna bring even more value to the iMac product line. For the first time ever, we're gonna have a 4K iMac that starts at just $12.99. But the updates don't stop with just the iMac, because we're refreshing our notebooks today as well. And together, the MacBook and MacBook Pro make up the strongest line of notebooks we've ever had. But we're gonna make them even better, because we're moving to Kaby Lake here as well. And we're bringing faster SSDs to our MacBook and faster standard graphics to the 15-inch MacBook Pro. So a great performance bump across the board. So here's that lineup, but just like the iMac, we're gonna bring more value here as well because we're gonna have a new configuration of the 13-inch MacBook Pro that also starts at just $12.99. So there you have it. We've updated seven of our most popular Macs, and the MacBook Air is gonna get a bump in, mega, in megahertz as well. And even better, they're all shipping today. Now, we care deeply about the environment, and so as with all our products, we've been working really hard to ensure that these new Macs are free of harmful chemicals, very energy efficient, and highly recyclable. So that's everything we're updating today, but it's not actually everything we wanna show you today. Now, the iMac line has incredible breadth. It spans from an entry-level system that's perfect for use at home or in a school, all the way up through that powerhouse 27-inch model which allows professional customers to create amazing things every day. But that said, there's another class of pro users who would love to be able to take advantage of the iMac's display and design, but they need workstation class performance that can't possibly fit into an all-in-one. Well, we wanted to challenge that assumption, and so we've been working really hard to see just how far we can push the iMac. Now, this isn't gonna be shipping until the end of the year, but I'm really excited to be able to give you a sneak peek at what we've been up to. And here it is. So that is the new iMac Pro. Now the first thing you'll notice, is it features the same great design as our 27 inch iMac, but it's in this seriously badass space gray finish. And with that stunning new color and gorgeous 5K display, this is without a doubt the most beautiful iMac we've ever made. But it's also going to be, by far, the most powerful iMac we've ever made. In fact, this will be the most powerful Mac we've ever made, because because we actually are going to put workstation class performance into our incredible 5K iMac design. Now to do that, the team had to completely rethink the thermal architecture. And they came up with this really efficient dual centrifugal fan solution, which generates significantly more airflow than a traditional iMac. In fact, the iMac Pro has a greater than 80% increase in cooling capacity. So that means we can deliver unbelievable performance while still maintaining the quiet operation you'd expect from an iMac. So let's talk about what's inside, and I wanna start with the CPU, because we wanted to go really big here. So the iMac Pro is gonna ship with an eight-core Xeon processor. But it's also gonna ship with a 10-core Xeon processor. And then we thought, you know, we've gone this far, let's get really nutty. So we're gonna offer it with up to 18 cores. That is a ton of compute power. But we didn't want to stop there because we wanted to go really big on graphics as well. So the iMac Pro is going to use AMD's Radeon Vega graphics. This is their brand new workstation class graphics architecture. It features a completely new GPU core and high bandwidth on package memory. 
it's going to be available with up to 16 gigabytes of VRAM and over 400 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And we aren't going to use an entry-level configuration here because our implementation is going to offer up to 11 teraflops of single precision compute power. That's three times more than the best GPU in a Mac Pro. But it actually gets even better because this Radeon Vega GPU can also do half precision compute. So that means the iMac Pro can deliver up to 22 teraflops of half precision computation. This is a really big deal for things like machine learning development. So the iMac Pro, as you can see, is going to be a monster when it comes to graphics, but we didn't want to stop there either. So we're going to let you configure it with up to 128 gigabytes of PCC memory. That's twice what you can do in a standard 27-inch iMac. And up to four terabytes of three gigabyte per second SSD. Now, the iMac Pro is also going to have a full complement of high-performance I.O., including four Thunderbolt 3 ports, and for the first time ever in any Mac, built-in 10 gigabit Ethernet. And with all that cutting-edge I.O., you can do some pretty amazing things. Like, you can hook up two 5K displays and two high-performance RAID arrays. No iMac before could ever do that. And when you combine that with the internal display, that means the iMac Pro can drive up to 44 million pixels. There's so much more we don't even have time to get into. Things like a 1080p FaceTime camera, a user configurable visa mount option, uh, two times wider AVX instructions, and even a UHS-2 SD card slot. So with all these high performance technologies and our incredible 5K display, this iMac Pro is going to be an awesome workstation for things like real-time 3D rendering, high frame rate immersive VR, machine learning development, and with all those cores and all that memory, super fast code compiling. Now speaking of workstations, we wanted to compare the starting configuration of the iMac Pro to what's on the market. And so if you were to go out and build a comparably spec system today, it would cost over $7,000. And keep in mind, that's a system that doesn't have our best in class 5K display, doesn't have the iMac Pro's incredible all-in-one design, and it obviously doesn't run Mac OS. Well, this is the starting configuration of the iMac Pro, and we're gonna price it at just $49.99. And it's going to be available in December. So that's a sneak peek at the iMac Pro. It packs workstation class performance into our incredible 27-inch iMac design with its gorgeous 5K display. And it is going to be the most powerful Mac we have ever made. So that is all of our Mac news today. Now back to Tim. Let's start.